As a deer hunter, I want to know all I can about America's favorite big game animal. That's why I became a deer farmer. Without deer farms, we lose our greatest resource for research and whitetail management. With them, we gain more knowledge than ever before. Join me as we discover the truth about whitetails and meet those who work every day to preserve this great species for future generations. My name is Keith Warren, and this is Deer and Wildlife Stories. Hey everybody, I'm Keith Warren and welcome to Deer and Wildlife Stories, where today it's gonna to be a major league road trip. Currently, I'm in Minnesota. I'm gonna head across the border to Iowa and then jump over to Alberta, Canada, and I'll introduce you to a bunch of friends of mine that are all crazy about elk. Yesterday afternoon, a baby calf was born. So what we're gonna do is put a tag in its ear, check the sex, and get out of there. The lifestyle of an elk farmer is great. You have something different every day. Currently, we are calving right now. Then we'll go into the velvet season here shortly. And then the bulls will start, start growing great big antlers. It's just an exciting thing to be around all year. This is the one that I was born yesterday. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna tag it and check for the sex. And it's a heifer. Looks healthy. And now that we're done, she can go back to her mom. I love this time of year. We get to see calves born every day. There's all different ways of making money with raising elk. You got the baby calves that you can sell to other breeders for breeding stock. You've got the animals that you can butcher for meat. It's very good, lean meat. You also have the bulls that you can sell for different genetic things to different markets. And then you've got the velvet off of the bulls. That's a renewable resource. Every year you cut that velvet. It is painless for the animal and it grows back every year. Currently the velvet market is in that 30 to $40 a pound range. I've seen it go as high as $100. It just varies from year to year. So it's early June. We've got a few bulls to bring in today. We've got two larger bulls that are five years old, as well as a spiker. We're gonna bring them into the handling facility. We'll sort them into individual compartments within the handling facility. Then we'll be able to look at the antler, write about the uh, special attributes of each individual antler, whether they have exceptional trade tines, larger tops, greater mass, whatever the attribute of that individual is. That is a part of our very important record keeping process. We're gonna take photographs of them. Then we'll bring the animal into the handling chute. We'll restrict them down so that all of it will be exposed is their head and their antlers. The first thing we do, we uh, put a, apply a tourniquet to the pedicle of the antler. This is put in place to reduce blood flow. The next thing we'll do is we'll apply, we'll apply a nerve block. There's four nerves in the uh, skin of a velvet antler, front, back, and side, and side. Our goal is to minimize any feeling in those nerves during the antler removal process. The next thing we do is we will take a scalpel and we'll begin to slice the, the velvet skin on the antler. Sanitation plays a very important role in elk antler removal. We use the sanitized handsaw for the actual removal of each individual antler. It's, it's much like sawing through a potato or a watermelon in its consistency. He's a little bigger than I was feeling. Got it? Got it. Now I apply Catron spray to the, to the stump in his ears. Prevents any insect problems. I'm gonna remove the tourniquet and then out he's gonna go. Research has proven that velvet antler is, is very useful for rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Velvet antler contains both glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate in a natural phase, and it's very useful for folks in bodybuilding, weightlifting, and high-performance athletes. 
So now I'm gonna observe the antler. I'm gonna look for damage to the antler, whether it be nicks or cuts, the, mu the mud. I need to remove the mud, so I'll, I'll uh, take the dry stuff off by hand. When we're finished with this, then we'll, we'll spray them all down with a hose and a brush before they go into the, into the freezer. First thing I'm gonna do now is weigh the antler. This is his right side. We'll get a weight, 1437. <clears throat> I'll record the weight as well as any notes I have on the confirmation of the antler. This antler's in pretty good shape. There's not a lot of damage, just a little bit of dirt on the, on the end from laying in the mud. When we take the antler, this one's very dirty. He's been rolling in the mud. The mud keeps the flies off of them and cools them down on a hot day. And we're in the middle of a, of a heat wave here in southern Minnesota. We've had several days of 90 degrees, which is not typical. I'll weigh the antler. 1285. Then I'll observe the confirmation. Fairly typical antler. Maybe a little, a little extra point coming on here. And decent uh, tine growth on the bottom three. For more information on elk farming, visit elkranching.org. Deer and Wildlife Stories is brought to you by Record Rack Deer and Elk Feeds, the North American Deer Farmers Association, Advanced Deer Genetics, Beam Fence Company, New Dart, Divine Genetics, North American Deer Registry, Protect the Harvest, Headgear LLC, Newport Laboratories, Superior Milk Replacer, and Dr. Ray Favero's Whitetail Genetics. Viewer feedback is presented by Protect the Harvest, Protect the Hunt. All right, Janelle says, I've been watching your show for years and I've always respected your outspokenness against animal rights groups. I don't want to sound naive, but have they ever done anything to you or your business? Janelle, that's a real good question. Uh, the animal rights extreme groups uh, consisting of uh, Humane Society of the United States, for example, is out there to do harm to anybody that, uh, that loves animals. And they are specifically out there to shame and to harm the American farmer. It's for that reason I'd encourage you to go to protecttheharvest.com and see how the HSUS, the Humane Society of the United States, and the animal extreme groups are actually doing things to shame the American farmer. Janelle, that is a great question, and if you've got a question or comment for me, go ahead and log on to deerandwildlifestories.com and shoot me an email. As the marketing and communications specialist at Cooperative Energy Company, um, I have a good understanding that all kinds of farming in rural Iowa is as important to us as, as any other kind of farming, elk farming especially. Whatever our members, our customers, whatever it's important to them, whatever their passion is, that's what's important to us. So just delivering the energy products and the services they need so that they can be successful in their operations, that's what it's all about. The economic benefits of elk farming are far reaching. For example, here in rural Iowa, the co-op winds up benefiting as well as the farmers benefit because of the services they provide to each other. What we're doing today is just delivering diesel fuel um, to the farmer for the operation so that they can keep on working. I'm a hunter. I, I hunt for all different species of animals, but elk are perhaps one of my favorite. The reason why, they're so majestic. And when you get in the country in which elk live, I mean, the part of the elk hunting experience is the country in which they live in. So uh, I tell people when you wind up calling in a bull elk during the rut, no matter where it is, Montana, New Mexico, it doesn't matter. It's like calling in a fire-breathing dragon. It is so exhilarating that what I have found after hanging around these elk farms the way I have, I have grown a much deeper respect for the elk because the elk is a wonderful animal that literally, as an elk hunter, I can't get enough of them hanging around with them for two to three weeks during the elk season. I like to hang around with elk year round. I decided to go with the elk route instead of cattle because I thought they were so majestic and I just 
enjoy being around them every day, the beauty of them, it's, it's unbelievable. Elk are a lot like cattle as far as uh, calving and taking care and, and just the general things about them. Uh, elk cow is called a cow and elk bull is called a bull. When they have a baby, it's a calf, just like cattle. Uh, the gestation is about eight months, eight days, and the, the beauty of a newborn calf, baby elk calf, is it, when you experience for the first time is just wonderful. The first week of June on Elk Farm is an exciting time of year because of these little guys right here. Little babies are being born. Gestation period is eight months and eight days on an elk. What we're gonna do, this is a little male, and we're gonna tag it. So Perry, you've got a system in which side will you put that tag in and why? Left, left bull, the left ear for a bull. Yep. Right ear for a heifer. No particular reason, it's just what we chose many, many years ago. Okay, now watch this. Like a little piercing. It makes a little noise. And what we're gonna do is watch out for mom. Make sure that mom is not around here. Mom will be here in just a few minutes and take this little guy up. But one reason for tagging, say, little bulls like this in the left ear on this particular farm, they can at a glance take a look and see which ones are bulls and which ones are ca or cows. And so they know male from female by the tag in what ear. So this little guy probably is what held. Uh, he was probably born about six hours ago. How cool is that? And if you're wondering about how much they weigh, they weigh about 30 pounds, wouldn't you say? Yep. About 30 pounds, so I think you're gonna love today's show. Elk are a lot like cattle as far as the grazing end of it. Elk love to graze on grass. Um, they eat about one third of what cattle do as far as grazing and total nutrition. They are very efficient when it comes to grazing. A lot of breeders will supplement with a feed and it just increases their genetics and their value. On average, supplement feeding is roughly around 2%. So on a 500 pound cow, you're talking about 10 pounds a day. And that varies on different times of the year when they're lactating, we like to increase their feed a little. For more information on elk farming, visit elkranching.org. Closed captioning provided by Keith Warren's Texas Hidden Springs Ranch. Now it's time for the Beam Fence Minute. I'm Mark Beam from Beam Fence Company. Today I'd like to show you how I pound posts. When I pound my posts, I like to make sure that each post is a minimum of four foot in the ground. This is important for the integrity and the strength of the fence. Integrity of the fence, you want to keep the post as straight as you possibly can. I shoot all my dots with a transit and that keeps things nice and straight, it's almost bullet straight. I've been building the fence for 27 years. I don't require a deposit from you. When I come to your job, I'm gonna be on the job with my crew all the time. I take each job I do very personally. I'm gonna put my name on it when I'm done. And I wanna make sure that you're satisfied when I leave. If you have any problems at all with your fence, you can give me a call, I'm gonna be back to take care of it. I'm Mark Beam from Beam Fence Company. If you'd like more information about us, you can contact us at beamfence.com. If you're a cattle rancher and interested in learning more about elk farming opportunities, log on to elkranching.org. As a deer farmer myself, I've wound up comparing deer to elk, and here are some of the few things that I've seen. First off, elk are a whole lot more calm than white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are pretty uh, jacked up, okay? But elk in the pen, I mean, they're calm. You can walk out there and see they're grazing. They're laying there chewing their cud. White-tailed deer are not that way. White-tailed deer are a little bit more high-strung. The number one piece of advice I could give to somebody that's thinking about starting to raise elk is go to a lot of different farms, get a lot of different people's opinion on how to do it, and start with good genetics. The great thing about raising elk is you don't need a large amount of property to start, and it is very inexpensive to get started. Raising elk is great for the family. Everybody can get involved, girls, boys. It's a great way of making a living.
Domestically in North America, one of the fastest growing industries for antler consumption is the pet industry. Both hard antler and the velvet antler are consumed by pets. For instance, dogs with hip dysplasia have been known to, to consume velvet antler as a nutraceutical with amazing results. Dogs that were unable to jump in the back of a pickup, walk up and down stairs, just a few short weeks after consuming a regular diet including velvet antler, are able to run again and jump again and enjoy happy and healthy lives. Hard antler dog chews are, are a very good thing around the house. They don't splinter and break apart. They don't make a mess on the carpet like other uh, bone and chew toys do. And dogs love velvet antler and hard antler both. Hard antlers are not only used for, for dog chews, but they're used for interior design, artwork, chandeliers, um, candelabras, uh, decorations around the house. Elk antler, European mounts, things of this nature around homes are very popular in interior design. And then we also have the hard antler market for game preserves. At a later point in life, we grow them into a hard antler bull and they're transported to game preserves. For more information on elk farming, visit elkranching.org. If you're ready to get started in deer farming, go to DeerAndWildlifeStories.com and click the Get Started Deer Farming tab. Well, I'm Kevin Workmeister with WorkWeld Incorporated. Behind me I have a 160 bushel elk feeder uh, designed easily to set up. Uh, one user can set it up in a very short period of time. Uh, pull a couple pins, you can fold out a rain awning which gives you additional 16 inches of rain protection, helps keep the feed dry. Also, you can fold down a panel which prevents the cows from going into the feeder. Calves can go in and get a specialty feed. Also, a ground opening lid. Open the lid from the ground with one hand, very easy to do. Feeder has four stabilizing jacks, two in the front, two in the back. Really user friendly feeder. Let's talk about handling facilities for a minute. If you're an experienced deer farmer or elk farmer, you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about here. If you're not, listen up, because every one of these handling facilities is really custom built for your budget, for the building that you're gonna put it in, for the location where you're gonna put it, the land. And, and so whenever you customize this handling facility for you, and every one of these places has got a different system, but they're all kind of the same, what's gonna happen is after you get done, you spend days and weeks and you get all this planning and you build it, I promise you the very first time that you run animals through there, the animals are gonna find the weakest point. And so no matter how much time you put into it, when you start run, running animals through there, you're gonna realize, you know what, I should have done this a little bit different. So don't get all hung up and say that facility has to be perfect from the get-go, because I promise you, it won't be. One of the biggest investments you'll have initially is for your fence and your handling facility. The handling facility is very important. This is where you'll do things like vaccinating, antler removal, antler scoring, and artificial insemination. Your design is based on the layout of your land and your financial ability. Most of this is custom made by local welding shops, so it's very helpful to the local industry. Elk are very easy to handle if you have a great handling system. We have a chute that is very easy to operate and keeps them safe. When raising elk, very seldom do you have to help a mother or pull a baby, but when you do, we have a good facility to put them into and help the mother pull the elk. Sometimes it turns out great, and sometimes you don't save them all. Go, go in. It's, uh, it's way down underneath there. Okay, we gotta watch. She's gonna come all the way back. If you're gonna be an elk or deer farmer, one of the things you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to realize that animal husbandry is the most important thing, taking care of the animals. And uh, not all the time things are happy on the farm. Uh, there, there, there are issues that come up that, uh, I mean, it, 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 being a responsible animal owner, you gotta take care of, and right now this is not pretty. So the reason we pull the baby if it has problems is to help save the mother. One of my heifers had troubles calving last night, so we had to bring her in, and it was a little tough. 
We saved the mom, but we didn't save the baby. But the most important goal is to protect them, try to save the mom. The loss we suffered last night was particularly difficult because that was my daughter's heifer and her, the heifer's first, first offspring. And that's our daughter's future, like she's going to inherit this farm, so that's part of her herd. So she suffered a great loss. And, you know, when you suffer a loss like that, you, you go to bed and you, you lay there for hours thinking about it, thinking, could I have done anything different? Could I have fixed anything different? You know, anything to, to, to have saved that calf. This episode of Keith Warren's Deer and Wildlife Stories has been made possible through the contributions of the participants in elkranching.org. Elkranching.org is a group of elk producers, businesses, and individuals associated with the elk industry. The goal is to provide minimally biased information about the elk industry. Elk producers are passionate about the industry and they want to realistically provide information, but to generically educate about the elk farming and ranching industry. The best way to learn more about elk farming is to call, email, or visit elk farms. Please go to elkranching.org for a complete list of the sponsors of this program.